we should uh, open the house. Yes. And if he's not around, he's not around. Okay. He'll join us when he gets here. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. And we all, I'll explain that he's uh, going to do the show. Coming to Yeah. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Rachel, what about this? I'm, I'm, I'm. Is that one there? No, no one's up there. Diane, the only thing we're waiting for is we have to wrap this. See this paper? This ribbon? Oh, dear. Yeah. Okay. That, does he know it's there? Yes. You told him. Because I don't know if he knows. Abby, have you seen Edwin? Gone what a day now. <laughs> Plenty of time for it. Yeah, we're going to start without it. Yeah. Oh, who's that? Trisha, can you grab that orange strap? 
Can you can you reach it without without hurting yourself? Yeah. And just kind of drape it over the over the. That's fabulous. Yeah, we can open the house. Are we ready? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just need one more reserve. Are you gonna use those? Center, center stage. Are you gonna use those reserves? Do you need them? For Lucy and Sally. We got it. We, 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 we got it.
everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the LATC and Latino Theater Company for hosting us, to Center Theater Group for sponsoring this exciting event. Just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we are live streaming this event, so if you want to connect to this conversation via Twitter or Facebook, please use the, ha use the hashtag Cafe Onda, New Play, or Encuentro 2014 for the whole convening weekend. We're so excited to be here, and this officially kicks off our meeting. The, the Encuentro 2014, we have 19 companies, 15 from around the country, four local companies who have been here for three weeks now. And this is the last weekend, beginning tomorrow, and then tomorrow another 108 artists are coming from around the country. It's the first event, you can see this five plays playing every night from Thursday to, sun, to Saturday night and five matinees every day. So if you haven't seen the place, come there phenomenal from Puerto Rico, Chicago, Nueva York, uh, Arizona, from everywhere. Denver. Denver. Denver, Denver. <laughs> yeah. Juan Bautista, Tiago Campesino. So we are uh, we're very honored and of course very excited about this conversation with Culture Clutch and El Teatro Campesino. <laughs> you know, the entire encuentro is about the legacy and the future mm -hmm. and moving forward. And how can we not have a dialogue with two great, great theater companies Woo! who have created great legacy in Latino theater in the United States. It's with great honor that we receive them here. And let me introduce to you the Associate Artistic Director of the Center Theater Group and the President of the Board of the Theater Communication Group, Diane Rodriguez. Uh, 
soon there'll be a question uh, period for, for you all. Uh, I'm going to keep time so that we can be out at 10, 10, 15, so we can have a reception together and socialize, which is what this is all about, right? So uh, I'm going to be a uh, real hard on that time. Uh, so first, I have a, a partner up there, Patricia Garza. and Rick Salinas, collectively known as Culture Clash, have gotten under the skin of audiences around the country with a unique brand of comedy. Here, uh, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, mm. what happened to Russia, the Communist Party? The party's over, who won't say? When you go see a Culture Clash show, I think there is a trademark. They know that we're going to go into some areas that might be uncomfortable for the audience to hear, and we'll do it. And, you know, we'll do it either through satire, you know, comedy, or drama. I never read Kafka! I never read Tolstoy! Be entertained, we're going to see comedy, but also in our shows we're going to ask what we think are important questions about, about who and what we are, as Angelinos, and a multicultural Los Angeles, but all, also as observers of the world. Culture Clash recently celebrated the 25th year of a trailblazing career that began in San Francisco's Mission District. Six of us came together with and created this comedy you know, group. And it went over so well that, you know, we started getting gigs on a monthly basis. And then it just turned into, one night turned into a, into a career. And then the three of us have been together since 1988. We went through so many changes. I think we reinvented ourselves. We went from doing stand-up comedy to sketch comedy to writing plays that had more meaning than just a slapstick or, or just for comedy sake. I, I saw them perform. And I remember that at the time, I was doing goofy jokes, like boom, boom, boom kind of jokes, you know, my mom and my dad and that kind of stuff. These guys all of a sudden came together, and, and I watched them, and I'm like, wait a minute, they're making people laugh at political stuff, and you could, you could do that? You could talk about presidents as long as it's funny? Oh man, it's a whole new game for me. That's why they did Robin and Power. I mean, that play was so powerful, it talks about corruption. Right. And when I saw that play, I said, every elected official needs to see this play. Things range from historical adaptations to satires on local politics, but they also explored links between different Latino cultures, making people take a closer look. Okay. Well, I put a lot for ourselves as a tricky situation because you will definitely offend people. You know, you have to go there because the minute comedy is saved, then it really doesn't do much. It's the culture clash of being Latino, you know, to mainstream America, that there's also the culture clash within our Latino races, you know, and we bring those out. We can be Latinos without having to be, oh, you're from El Salvador, oh, you're from Mexico, oh, you're from Venezuela. They've taken the vernacular of, like, the Mexican and the Puerto Rican, put it together and made something funny out of it. It made us all look at ourselves and, in a funny way and go, you know what, yeah, we do do that. And, all right, that's funny. And maybe not all of us, but enough of us, that, that works. In 1993, Culture Clash made television history when they were assigned to star in the first Latino-themed sketch comedy show on a major network. Still, they are most proud of their groundbreaking work on stage at some of the country's most prominent theaters and performing arts centers. When we travel the country, we go to these prestigious theaters and see three Latino men who write their material, produce it, uh, you know, and have a point of view that they normally don't see. And what we found in American theater is that that an audience is really willing to listen to the dialogue, you know? An audience doesn't look like us. They use the tools of comedy to say something very serious and valuable for the Latino community and for everybody in this incredible city which has such diversity. You know, after doing Chavez Ravine and Water and Power and now Palestine, New Mexico, it's great to see how the audience changes. We get a lot of Latino, younger folks, uh, People of color come to see plays, you know, that we do here at the Mark Tate Perform for the first time for many of them. We decided as artists that there's an inherent responsibility that comes along with being an artist for us. We want to entertain the heck out of you, yes. We want to make you laugh, yes. But we also want to take a moment to think about some of these vital 
and important issues that affect every American. As long as you're talking about it and thinking about it, I think we've done our job. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
that moment that echoes to now, you know, where you have to move over and all those things, right? But where there was autocriticas the next day, you had to sit down with feminists from the East Coast, and Mexico, and people that were, were, were people that were pro communist and people that were pro Latina, mm -hmm. and it wasn't a pretty mix. Mm -hmm. and, and somewhere in the middle was us, and we just didn't know better, so we just we thought we just had to storm, you know, the stage. Mm -hmm. And 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 I remember at the autocritica after. All of a sudden, we said, you guys have to write a play or you won't be taken seriously in this world. And I think mm. that we took that very seriously. We took that very much to heart. What's interesting about watching the Channel 7 play, yeah. we didn't use the word Chicano very much. I think we were playing a little bit to an audience, but just working on Chavez and Green this week, I mean, it's, 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 it's uh, that Denas woman was a very kind of Chicano moment that made room also for groups from Puerto Rico, New York, Mexico. But where we just didn't know better. And, and, and you just did this phenomenally, like, could even have been atrocious performance, but it was, it was produced at a level. It, 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 it had a part of the sketch and teatro, and it was a hybrid scene that we just didn't know. We were grasping for what teatro had left. It was already uh, people pushing into the very late 80s, early 90s. And so we were grabbing from all these things that. Part devised works, right. part, part making it up on the spot. And uh, it's interesting about in terms of the leader for Culture Clash, no, at that time there was absolutely no lead singer, no leader, yeah. no guy, you know, we just were like, I think Bursiaga was still with us. Oh, Talk yeah. about Reagan you know, that yeah. guy would give us, you know, but we were in Chicago, we were in, in Connecticut, and we were for the first time as little babies out there and just saying, man, you know, fuck it, no way, we gotta go for it and bring our Chicanada and bring the Salvadoran thing. And, it was, it was a rough, it was a rough embrace. Right. What, 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 why do you think that? Because was it that oh, you were... Oh, this is a follow-up. No, no, I'm just, yeah, I'm just curious because <laughs> you're saying that you were uh, sort of the young, the, the young group that came out, and, and, and is that why it felt like a high point, or... I just remember you and you could run into Jose Sancero in the back. Right, and right. Was yeah. and, right. And you know, you might do a little bump, and you might be part of all the time. <laughs>
started to write about America, other immigrants, through a Chicago perspective. So that really opened us up as writers, as, as Americans, as actors. It just opened up a new canvas for us. So I'm really grateful for that. We didn't have a plan because we didn't have a board. <laughs> <laughs> It's every 10 years, you know, so the first 10 years coming out of the mission district, Renee Young is, you know, yeah. and got an ear that I Margot Gomez. It was a weird moment of part performance, part stand-up, part sketch. Uh, I had already been to the Apple Company as an intern, but I had done Corridos at Marines Memorial with uh, uh, Luis, and, 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 and as, as a young man in the 80s, it was, it was spooky, because I remember the, the, the hardcore theaters, but I, the, the, the theaters that were left in the mission, they didn't really take too far. But it was a polished, beautiful, highly aesthetic vision of, of decent. I was just a kid. I mean, self. Uh, you did cost of the in the first version. I mean, I'm, I'm leaving out people, but uh, it, it was. But every 10 years, it seems to be the cycle, and then the site specific work. And then somewhere 20 years later, you know, Gomez Pena says the uh, cul de sac of naval gazing of identity. You know, where the questions, the core question was, am I Chicano, am I Latino, am I Hispanic? The core question was like, what the fuck am I doing in the world, and am I destroying the world? So we were, we were on to a bigger question, but, 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 but rooted in, in, in a kind of strong Chicano you know, you know, San Mateo, you know, I got born, people, right. Dolores, we were just a phone call from our elders, you know, all the way. And then the site-specific event, and then 25 years after that, a kind of a confidence to go back, with our world view to the Chicano world. Chavez Ravine, Water Power, Zorro, Palestine and Mexico. Yeah. You know, these, these, these are drenched in, in, in our myth. And, and I'm really glad we're revisiting Chavez Ravine because in, in my opinion, that was our best play as a collective, you know? Where all, you know, all the tricks of the trade, everything we've learned up to then is in that play. You know? And I'm so glad we revisited it. And I think to revisit the tape, you know, that Zoot Suit is the granddaddy of all, you know, bar none, no questions, you know. But Chavez is, is bucking up as, as one of the little, <laughs> tiny little primos, you know. <laughs> well, because the Chicano legacy is kind of important, you know, and in the film world, Zoot Suit is still, and then American, and then maybe something like Water Tower. I mean, we're still, we're still consciously aware and we're about that idea of, of you know, how, how Chicano work is and mm -hmm. getting that over do, do you think that, you know, you did Water and Power almost 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. I mean, not Water and Power, uh, uh, Chops uh, Review like, almost 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And um, when you talk about a period of, of real growth and real inspiration, do you feel that the, the time, the social times, has, have had something to do with the, the response of your work? Well, we did a reading today, you know, and um, uh, there's, 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 there's some sketch moments, and, you know, there's uh, a lot of Vince Scully and Fernando, and then, and then it got to the moment at the very end of the piece working with Lisa Pearson, their longtime collaborator, and working there at the taper, you know, and, and you know, the Zoot Suit posters on the hall. Yeah. My dad did the first Zoot Suit poster, you know, I mean, the history, you know, you can see Evelina in that picture, you can see... Roberto Delgado, uh, Delgado, you, you can see uh, Daniel Valdez, Eddie, you know, there are, these are the halls that you want to be in. So we get to the end of the damn play and uh, it's, it's almost impossible to get through it. And it's impossible to get through it because of the hatred that's surrounding those immigrant buses full of children. It's hard to get through it because of all the things that, that are happening and focused on the people. And, and, and because Chavez Ravine endeavors to tell the story of the early activists, right? Right, right where Zoot Suit left us. Fred Ross, Sal Alinsky, a young Chicana endeavoring to organize and galvanize unions in Los Angeles, labor in Los Angeles. You know, we don't operate in a vacuum. We are kind of connected to all these things. And just getting to the final moment in, in the piece um, this afternoon was terribly difficult because of the 10 years. Because of the meta performance of you know three guys trying to keep it together, it hasn't been perfect. Right. We'll get about the worst. We'll get yeah. to the worst day soon. But you know, <laughs> there are those moments where yeah. you're fragmented, you're dysfunctional. You know, it's it's not perfect. It's like like a familia. But we realized a few years ago that we 
each of us, we had stayed together somehow longer than our parents had ever stayed together. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had all come from broken families, so we are trying to keep this brotherhood imperfect as it is, you know, trying, trying um, to keep it together somehow. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that 10 years, I, I just felt everything coursing in, in the final moments of the piece today. And, you know, I just yeah. needed, I needed, our, I needed people to pull us through. Right. We just could not get through it because lives have been lost, lives are gone. Mm -hmm. People that we're depicting are no longer with us. And then at Culture Clash, I think the meta thing that I'm proud of and that makes me feel good and a good day is that we're getting out of the way for a Chicano protagonist. Mm -hmm. And we're saying your, your, your deals are going to, you know, we're all, but there's the road and you're going to add your own thing to the road. And just, just, just casting in the last week for, for Chavez has been an eye opener. And the beautiful, strong Chicanas and Latinas that have come through. And I yeah. said to Jose and Alina, their daughter Esperanza, her talent That's is great. bigger than any distractions that we might ever have. Ooh. Any better we might have. <laughs> and she blew us away, and she's in full position for it soon to come back, whatever. Taper knows who uh, she is, and rightfully so. And we were there as a deal, you know, like. Not always perfect and good deals, but we were there. We had, you're going to do this, you're going to do it, you're going to be fucking great. And think about all the Chicanos who've ever auditioned at the taper. You know? mm -hmm. That's big time, man. We, we deserve to be there. We should be there. Mm -hmm. And we should be here as well. Mm -hmm. You brought up the, the whole concept of family. You know, when you talk about these two ensembles, we are family. Literally, a family from the ceiling is a family. You know, there's a, a family business and yeah. beyond. But, it's a family and, business. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, all of them are not related to the you know. And what happens in families is there's it's a vortex of emotions, right? Yeah. Good and bad. Love, intense love and intense hate, you know? And I think that, you know, those are the things we can talk about later, but you know, it, it's it's like having a family. Yeah. Talk about them now, Cardinal. <laughs> <laughs> there's no later, Cardinal. And I mean you got there's there have been some uh, real life and death situations in the in the group but earlier in the Bay Area and so what what has been the most challenging uh, to date for you? And I'm sure there's more than one. Yeah, because that's where Selena's story. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So there, there was that moment, you know, in our brother Sean San Jose is here from San Francisco, a couple of South yeah, brother, okay. and just a collaborator, and, and that's another story about how we're reaching out and moving to other companies and, and, and that sort of work. But there was a moment in 89, I believe it was, where we were having a culture clash meeting in the Mission District. And at that time, the mission wasn't the uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon buses driving out. It's, it's, it's brutal right now. It is, it is brutal. It's yeah. absolutely most. You know, Rene Yanez and Yolanda Lopez are the last of the mission, yeah. and they're out, they're out, they're done. Yeah. And so all the murals, everything that, that, that Latinos and Chicanos did to, to make the mission uh, can no longer afford to live there. They barely can afford to live in the region. We can't afford Berkeley and Oakland, even at this point. Um, but back then in the mission, you know, you had, you, had, you had teatros, you had galleries, you had all these things, you know, going on. We've got a, you know, and we're having a meeting, and, and there was a production in, in San Juan at the time, so uh, Jorge Galvan and Danny Haro. We were meeting, and Rick always had a fun apartment in the Mission on Harrison and 25th, man. Musa, the party was in Iran, and Socorro, I think, was in the area. It was, it was, it was, it was a milieu, you know, it was not Sacramento. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, wasn't, it wasn't LA yet either. It was the Mission. Yeah. Very different, man. It, 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 had salsa, it had Afro Caribbean, and it was, you know, you had Chileno, uh, Taller, Graticos, Malaquias, Montoya, Rene Castro, I mean, it was a you know, and a great place to be in your early 20s as a well, child. Subsequently, we were highly criticized being the, the payasos of the movement, they weren't quite ready for us, the Chilenos and Berkeley were not ready for us. They were fun and check about it at that time, but we were there with one. Then again, you were seventh year or so in culture clash, and Phyllis Barca, you know, putting us on the road, you know, and, and uh, when you go to Chicago, sign a disclaimer. I don't want to, if you guys impregnate anyone over there. <laughs> <laughs> getting, getting the lecture on the bill as far as, you know. <laughs> I think 
think of Paul somewhere where they, they made them say you're getting a culture clash and check. My brother's a banker in Chicago. We cashed a check. We're like millionaires. And the film's like, where's the check? We cashed it. But anyway, we're, we're in the mission district. And, and, and Mordecai is there. And, and they're doing that, one of the plays, uh, Christmas play or something. But, um, mission district that could be dangerous at the time. There were housing projects everywhere. And we were talking Talatena and, and, and actors. And, and something's happening outside. It was a park. And, we just went to the window, and, and sure enough, uh, a pretty rough housing project there. Two guys were looking like they were they were killing you know, a, a kid. You know, they were about to, to finish him. And we're like, hey, 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 stop it! And this young African American kid, you know, trapped in the world. He, he, we didn't, and we had no idea. He had a sawed-off shotgun. He just turned mm -hmm. to the stupid Salinas was in the door. So Salinas gets hit. Uh, short range in the chest. Uh, uh, Jorge gets heavily hit. Uh, the lifeblood of our groups was seeping out of us mm. at that moment, and that's that's not an over uh, that's not an overly dramatic thing to say. It's Rick summoned them. Jorge is in the kitchen, and and the kids get away, but the cops show up, and the cops just assume we shot each other. You know? uh. And uh, Rick goes off to SF General. Uh, Jorge goes off to SF General. And it's just one of those moments that I think every every group, every capital has faced. I remember the, the, the kid from Los Pedros, I think it was a Pedro, that I saw in a thing that who, who, who traveled over the grapevine. And, you know, we lost yeah. people. Yeah. And I was just certain we were losing Rick Salinas that night, you know? And then two years later, here we are on this stage. Right. You know, so that's how it that turned around. That, yeah, so we didn't lose him. Yeah. But it was the prayers of a lot of people. There were a lot of. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of baba a lot of people. I mean, just you know, and, and it had ramifications too. I mean, from the from the penitentiaries to the streets, people were pissed. You just almost killed, you know, these two guys. There were there was fallout, um, and that's just the way the mission worked at that time. Sometimes you had to, get, you know, not everyone got the nonviolent memo from Sessa. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes things had to be weeded out. And, we weren't in that world, we were artists, but, but uh, we were too busy trying to, to bring uh, Rick back and, and, and Phil and Diablo Chris back on the road. And we got Francisco Hernandez, a Diablo kid, a Kinan's buddy, who calls the high kid, and we filled in for, for Rick. And we went and did ASU, and we, you know, we, we kept it, we kept it going. But that wasn't my worst moment, but go ahead. <laughs> and this is a subject matter that comes up a lot among uh, ensembles. Groups, is that the, the, the evil, I'll call it the evil shadow of the is right here in LA, you know? And I think that was really, really hard on us. You know, because we came and we got all this success and all that, and then we started feeling the pools, you know, the agents that, you know, hey Richard, you look like the Rico Sunday guy. Why don't I have a seat on You know, so there was like, a, for a couple of years there, it was like really iffy, you know, it was, who could survive because we were getting, you know, we were getting seduced by folks like Hollywood, you know? And then, when all said and done, you just spent three years in a, in a production deal that never went anywhere, or a, or a sitcom, a stupid sitcom that would have probably ruined our career. You wouldn't be here because you could trust that something that had sitcom. So, um, so I thank God that we, not thank God that we were successful in Hollywood, but, but that our dignity, that our dignity, you know, kept us going, and we started, we kept being set. I mean, the, yeah. the TV thing happened. It was 30 shows. 
I think the part that we are proud of is, is that, man, we were doing, I think Rupert Murdoch came to one of the tapings and was like, I gotta kill this thing, because we had Pete Wilson like, like zapping people with x-rays out of his eyes, zapping them back to the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it was, we, were, we were somewhat fearless and didn't know better. Yeah. And we were like, well, and we spent every dime on, on the TV show, which was much different than the sitcom that, that Herbert's referring to. That we did with Cheech Marin, was a, which was kind of a heartbreak for Cheech and us. We thought we'd be the big, you know, Hispanic fuck shit and a shit gun on my <laughs> But uh, someone gave my nephew in Chicago gave me the VHS of it recently, I, and we watched it. And it's like I can't even recognize ourselves, in, and okay. that's that's that Mambo King moment, like where I I can't really quite recognize that wavery picture. That's that's not us. It's a version of us. But it's not as but we quickly, quickly slapped ourselves and got right back from the right. sound of, of, of creating a, 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 the next back. body of work. We're going back to the Peter's old kind of helpless. Got it. And so what's your, what, you had another moment, another. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, Diane, you know, we're, we're, we're hopefully that we've, we've gotten better as communicators and we navigate in many, many worlds, you know. And, that when we get into these these ondas and these things where your idea or what you're trying to say and, and the way that you might even be saying it and question and that I feel that the worst moment is sometimes when we feel we're so far outside of, of groups and encuentros and and as 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 one of the innovators of devised collected site specific Work for our era, you just want to feel that you have something to share yeah. and you have something to say. Yeah. And we understand that the tragedy of selection committees and, and this and right. that, you know. But but our, our thing with with this employment was like we'll do characters in the basement. That's what we pitched. Right. We'll do all our characters in the, because they're anyway. But but however it goes, and the, we didn't fill out the right paperwork and all of that. That that that's fine. But when you're standing outside of it and you're looking at this thing right. that's going on, and you know you can go support it, and I've come, right. we've come and we've right. sent people. I did a whole radio thing right. with Kanan, and point on, point on, and point on. And you got it. There's so many young people here, they don't even know who Culture Clash is, and that's great, mm -hmm. and that's fine. But you want to you wanna fuel this thing that across the board, academia, academia, teatros, nonprofits, it, it's, it's what we're writing about and who we're writing for. Right. But it's not just an idea that, that we're hating on each other's work, but that we're eradicating each other's work. And there are times I felt a methodical march that from the history, from your body of work, like that, that you still have to keep fighting for that. And, and some people say, hey, you don't have to fight. No, no, you do. You do because, because you know, the, the respect that we get in New York, Samuel French, right. uh, your communications group, all of our work being published, and, and then what we're doing, we just when when you're home, you just all, all it is is each of us want to feel that we're part of that extended familia. And for whatever reason, some really good, some legit, reach out, we reach out. And something's just you know that we're master communicators, and that you're still on the outside looking in. That's that's kind of surprising. But being from the from the norte that we are, from Sacramento, and places like San Francisco, we, we kind of we we've, we've enjoyed and we've taken advantage of that outsider status a little bit. And yet some people say, well, you're not outside because you're on your eighth production of the Mark Taylor Forum. And that's true, and that's one of the paradoxes uh, right. of our lives as well. No, and I think that that's a really good, I think, no matter where you are in your career, there are moments when you don't really feel like you're on the outside and you're always trying to break in. And I think that that is, a lot A lot of us artists feel that sure, sure. Yeah. throughout. So I, I, I'd like I, to add on to that. I, I, think so I appreciate that. I understand I'm that. just trying and, to be honest and, and, today. And, and, I appreciate you yeah. having us in this moment, adding Puebro to share and to talk. I've seen many of these people on stage in the last couple of weeks, and there's some tremendous work. And, and you know, your videos, and, and we're not ready for the old people. So I, mean, okay. I, I don't want to bore everybody with what we're doing, but it's it's pretty amazing that it, it, we're not just bringing back Chavez Ravine. We're doing a revival of ghostly, haunted, Revival of LA, taking into, into consideration the context of the 10 years that have passed and, and where we are. Because 10 years ago, we were headed to a, a pretty good place of uh, suburban middle class Hispanics, and then and then Arizona comes around, yeah. and then yeah. we're we're not that far away actually. Right. Right.
No, I just want to talk about, uh, I think, on the other hand, on the other side of the point is this, we've had this fierce independence as a group. Uh -huh. Fierce, uh -huh. autonomy, totally autonomous, totally fearless and, and independent. And then we've never been associated with anybody, a group, you know, think or anything like that. We're terrible at it, you know, going to <laughs> meetings and following yeah. up, you know, filling up. We read, well, yeah, <laughs> we're not good administrators that way, you know, we, 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 we like to, we're artists first, and I think that's why we never had a board. I, do not, I don't have any interest in talking to my board member about that. <laughs> 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 it sounds elitist, it sounds elitist, but it's not, you know. The guy that, you know, he, he's, you know, he makes pizzas in the day, you know. Yeah. He's got a lot of money, but he doesn't know what he's talking about, you know. And so, um, board members, all that, and, and, and organizations, and we just really have not, not been into that. And I think that independence, that freedom, that life of anchor has, in a sense, been, in my mind, good for us as always. There's a flip side. Yeah. I want to talk to Preston. <laughs> That's it. What, 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 what's the future? Yeah. What's in the future? Well, you know what? Uh, taking uh, water and power from the stage to the film um, world as a fiercely independent Chicano film, filmed in 12 nights in Los Angeles for a price, um, it, it was an eye opener for me, and I can see what the lure is uh, and the importance for our storytelling to be broadened and taken to the screen. And Luis and, and even Latino Theater Company has, has made a few films. Um, working very closely with people like Eddie almost and stuff. Um, and, and just seeing what, something born of the stage and how it can play in Denver and how it can play, you know, in Chicago and, and have that moment where you're walking into the Chinese <laughs> theater and it's your film. I remember going to two premieres, world premieres. I went to uh, Zutsu at, at the, um, what's the arc like now, but the Cinerama Dome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I was telling that, yeah, I was like, man, you had the volume really turned up that night, but I understand why they do that. And the flash bulbs that night were like ear piercing, right? But it was powerful, something you never forget in your life. And then I went to La Bamba at the Chinese Mayor. You know? And then, then your moment comes, and your film's opening, you know, a festival or something, and there, there you are at, 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 at Universal or, or, or Chinese Man, and, and it's water and power. It's something that that I wrote for these guys, and, and then it made its way to the social screen. It still struggles as a small, <coughs> independent feature film, but I, I think I think that's part of the future, too, is, is not necessarily what plays can we take to film, but what is our next film subject, and I'm really proud that with my producer, Mark Roberts, because people have said to me, don't, don't do another one of those movies, which means don't do another Chicago film, which struggle to get into film festivals, by the way, which are unapologetically, you know, they're male, and, and they're dark, although I maintain that Water and Power tells the story greatly of, of how men have in the absence of a strong head, and the mujer is actually in that film in, in many ways, and the children, and, and symbolically she's there, but I, I, I think what our next what our next film and, and that future will be like the world of Chicano painters, you know, LA, my dad's world from Sacra to Brocha de Barrio, Ernie Palomino all the way to Carlos Amaras. That world, if we don't tell that world on film, explosive with color, why Amaras was trying to run over my dad's head at Avocado Lake in Fresno. I want to know. <laughs> Our place chased the ghost of Pinedo and my dad in Murciaga on the street corner below the east side after Zutsudo was at Schubert. We chased those ghosts for five years. I want to chase these other ghosts and find out what the hell was going on. So the future is, is for me, is, is part of that, continuing our work with Culture Flash. I think we made a, a pact that we would tell a few more stories. No one's going to be mad if we hung up the, the clown noses after 30 years, but I think we've got a few left in this because people want to work with us and, and they're interested in, in, in the colectiva. But like Herbert, I want to I want to work with other companies like Sean's uh, company, uh, Campo Santo, and, and we have yet to crack the, the big broad way. And, and I, I don't, I, I, I check myself that I want to do it for all the right reasons, but right. there's a few stories we have not right. told yet that right. are, are worthy of Broadway. Right. Um, no, we, you know, we took a, recently we took a forced two year sabbatical because I went down to San Diego Red. But I think it was healthy for the group, you know? They, 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 you know, we all developed as writers, as performers outside the group, and now we're coming back with a full fresh new take. 
on Chavez Ravine and the future. So yeah, it, but we can't just like, people say, well, we want the next culture clash to play. It's not that easy anymore. You know, right. we've grown out of that. You know, it's harder to write as a collective now. And we just gotta be honest about that. Is that because you? We're, we've grown up with yeah. individuals now that want to say something. On your own? On your own. <laughs> I think Louis said in Boston at that point though that, that what a great, what a great joke that these three sketch guys uh, turned into playwrights because, right. because he had seen the river with Lakin and Camposanto that Sean had directed, and and I'm excited that the future also uh, leads uh, to you and I working this right. this thing that we're going to create this piece with Roger William Smith about Black Latino relations in L.A. post World War to to, to, to whatever that window is, right. Diane. And as, as comrades, we've said, you're directing it, because you've said, we're writing it. Yeah. And we have to green light each other. Guys. There's no way, you've you got to direct it, man. And we're going to get in a room, and we're going to do it. Let that one guy, Suicidal Tendencies, was a, was a punk band that we really loved, and sent them, you know, uh, the board uh, Cypress, and so there was just a group of, of names and lists that would come and do uh, word of the day on the Culture Clash TV show. We did one, Jimmy Smith, a Dolores. What's interesting about when Dolores came to do a word of the day, the, uh, we didn't realize that all the cameramen and people in the booth were complaining about the great lady, you know, so we were, we were, we were battling uh, just on almost every level. So they let it go as far as they could. Looks like we put that in. Yes. Remember, you made an <coughs> interesting comment that you're no longer the old culture, the culture clashes. That, that it's had its time. And <coughs> but the two of you, I mean, your partner Rick, aren't there? You have three playwrights that are trying to collaborate. Yeah. Um, I really do hope, I think you do have the talent to put something on Broadway, and I really look forward to it. I really hope that you, but it is a real. Talking about that, how three people try to write one play? Mm -hmm. It's awesome. <laughs> 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 no, but you know, we've done it, we've done it, but it's not, it's not easy. It's yeah, not, that's it's, a, you know, it's, it's hard. It's really hard work. And it's hard to do it by yourself. Yeah. yeah. And you have two other guys, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> you know, and you have every one, like, why am I doing, you know, so it's just hard. You know, I don't know. I don't know how the next project's going to, you know, whether Richard's going to be the lead writer, you know what I'm saying? We have to negotiate that, because I don't know. 
You know, it's funny because I was, um, we used to joke, you know, that we don't really write a play without, you know, a Yaley in the room or an academic. Right, right. For, all the, for all the protesting we do about academia, right. there's always a Yaley in the room or we're at Yale or whatever the case. And that's not <laughs> shit. We could be at Gilroy Garden Festival tomorrow. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> but just working with Lisa in the last week, I, I mean, we really, we really do check in, you know, um, because and she's not a referee and a moderator, but she's that voice, you know? It's a move head, she's there, and try this or try that or move that around. And I, I, at that, when you're writing at the taper level, you're not writing in a vacuum. You have to deal with a lot of people and you have to answer to a lot of people. You have to do that here at LATC. You have to do that anywhere that you're at. You're not, days might be gone, and, you know, you could write a little something. But I look forward to writing a little something where it doesn't include like people. But I think for a culture clash having, having those people around us drawn into her, John Glore, Joy Lee, this, this is helpful to us because we're not just in a room battling it out. My dad used to call it a butcher shop. You know, we're, not, we're not in the butcher shop hurting each other. Because right. it could, it, I do this trick because I asked August Wilson, I asked other writers, I've asked police, I've said, when do you write? When do you write? It's, you know, because it's the opposite of ADD. It's permanent homework for any playwright. If you're ready to do homework your entire life. <laughs> and I think the nerding, I think that we love that nerding. But I will go to the Writers Guild in, on the, in the Fairfax and I don't need this to play now, but I'll trek all the way in my second Cadillac because I need that quiet place to go and have my dignity and a cup of coffee. It's the old union hall. It's the old red union hall idea because you can go to the Writers Guild and if you're not a union member, you can go to the library next door, and you can just shut everything out, and you can really try to be a writer for a few hours a day. Because I know, I know in my heart when I've had an honest few hours of writing, and when I when, it, when I have it, and you know when I'm just emailing. With all the talk about the highbrow and fabulous things that you've done, how do you feel about being um, cameo? in the Canderville cam comic strip. Are you even aware of it? Oh yeah, I'm aware, aware of it. I don't understand it though. I mean, I know we're in, uh, he talks about our group, right? Well, you show up all the time when, um, when he's reading the newspaper. There are times when his buddy's saying incredibly asinine things, and he's reading the newspaper and he says, thank God for culture class. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I we're guess introducing a little sandy through humor. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I'm glad he's a fan. Yeah, I'm glad he's a fan. Anyone else? Back down there. Yes. We have to walk right here. Open it up. There was spending millions of dollars just for one week on your show. Right, right. The crowds are there, but we haven't been to the house. I looked at you. And I know how expensive this is when you show. But yeah. we have all these empty theaters on Broadway, which is the, the Borscht Belt opened up in the 20s, so they carry their theaters, so we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's your flashback at LAPC? Good point. Good point. survive 
survive as an writer. Mm -hmm. I could not survive as an actor. No way. No way. I need that loyalty. I need that commission. Otherwise, I would not be able to survive. And you, and you guys toured your own work as well. Sometimes when you were working at a theater, there was you were producing your own work. Yeah. I mean, there was there were many many years of self of self producing as well. You said in your opening remarks that were um, lovely that um, you know we never had a home. And it's been really interesting, you know, a space. Yeah. And there have been efforts in recent years to, you know, get a space, bricks and mortar, but, you know, with that comes this incredible responsibility. Then you do need a board, you know? Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with a board. I party with the LATC board all the time. I heard, I heard from them recently. Yeah. Uh, it, it, they're, they're a great mechanism and a great tool to, to, to keep us. She must a little bit in check too, like, hey, what's that? You guys know how to slow down, you know? Because that doesn't happen in a corporate world, you know? So I see value in that, but we've been able to navigate to the sister's question. We've been able to navigate this idea of, you know, commission works, individual work. Uh, we'll be at Emerson for a residency. Um, um, that was following the appointment with, with David and Polly and Jamie and this whole group. We'll be there for, you know, so we, we still got to pack up the, a steam trunk and head out onto the road and, and do that part. And then, <clears throat> like a lot of people, pitching those television shows that you can stomach and do, and <laughs> what's your next film going to be about, and then the new works. I'm excited about our work. The work No Godless with uh, for Campo Santo was a map, was a map grant. Um, so you're navigating all these works and, and managing them, in a sense. I mean, we, Culture Clash could use an assistant. We're just stubborn guys that are doing it a certain way. But we've been able to sustain somehow. And don't wait for the commission. I've written three plays on spec and they've all been produced. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So even that's going to give you more right. freedom. Right. Right. It's right. mine. You know? yeah. I'll take it wherever I want now. Uh, I am going to take one more question. Who's got a good one? Bernie Holt, she's had a good one. Yes. Um, I love that you talk about, like, you know, as culture clash, like, like taking advantage of that carelessness and fearlessness, which is like totally like mind-boggling for me because it's like, oh, that's really hard. Like, how do you just how do you just put the blinders on and just focus on what you want to do? How do you harness that carelessness and fearlessness as, as an artist? I think I know that's super vague and weird, but like, I'm dying to know. <laughs> well, it's funny because it, you know that carelessness. It, it that's that's a youthful. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> you lose a little bit of <laughs> because you don't want to be that angry old man. You know? Angry young man is barely tolerable. <laughs> but what you want to be always uh, is a fierce storyteller. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Just fuck it, man. Go for it. You know, fearlessness. They they talk a lot about that at Sundance Institute when you when you when you go. I mean, I think Redford's committed to that. You know, I think the Institute part, the festival, no, the Institute is committed to your fierceness as a storyteller. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm really, I'm proud to sit in the grandmother's home that lost a 15-year-old kid last year in Nogales. I'm doing my work. I'm there with Sean so Jose. We're doing our work. What happened? My son was shot 20 times by a U.S. war You know, and we have to tell that story fearlessly. But I think what we've learned throughout the years is to almost tell it clinically now. Mm -hmm. Don't spin it too much. Sure, Arpaio has a big sign around his neck. Racist, Koch brother, tea party. But you know, we sat with him for an hour and a half. He's a fascinating dude, man. Mm -hmm. He was in Korea. My dad was in Korea, okay? Mm -hmm. He had Googled me. His grandchildren love Nacho Libre. After 30 years of theater, I'm in for Nacho Libre. <laughs> 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 He's a he's a uh, Italian Catholic. But he knew my mom was heavily Catholic, you know, and, and, and it was like, hey, come on, hey, you know. And so I think to tell his story straight, no chaser, would be doing our audience a service and, and giving our audience credit. They can discern who the devil is. You know, should we place angel wings on the grandmother, the abuela, of the dead boy, and put and put horns on our pile, or do you put horns on the cartels? And you put angel wings. On, on the blonde feminista border activist that's leaving water for people that are going to die in the Sonoran Desert on the American side. 
And then there's, there's scientists at Notre Dame that are, have gotten permission from the Pima County coroner to study how people die in the snow desert. Oh. Un unthinkable, we can't look at it, but, but I'm glad the scientists are because my work now needs to be backed up with data, Diane. I can't just go out there and start talking again, but I have to know what we're talking about. What is that hate, that hate surrounding all those immigrant children? Well, how many detention centers in Texas? How many in Arizona? You know, and when you travel those areas and you see those detention centers, hey, man, this is great, we're having a party, we're cool, we're good, we're articulate, very have a discernible accent, but there's children locked up in a detention center right now all throughout the Southwest, and this is post-racial Obama time. From Twitter, yes. from from Courtney Flores, she asks, <laughs> "Is <laughs> is Culture Clash going more into film, or is it going to be an extension of their theater work?" You know, I feel, feel if you can get the work in film, you know, it's, it's interesting. But I, I, I differentiate. I, I think independent filmmaking is is really uh, cool if you could you know raise that money and and, and make those films and, and what what young people are doing in their phones and yeah. their cameras it's you know you could you can get a million hits now on, on something that's that holds together and, and can be quite beautiful i think that we're old enough to come from a world where everything's kind of got to be set up yeah uh, what's that you know where uh, kickstarter is good if, if, if you know, for a certain filmmaker of a certain age, when, when you're our age, you, you want to have the ducks lined up and go out. You know, um, an Almaraz uh, film that encompasses the world, Chicano Air Force and, and, and all the artists, that's not a cheap film, that's a period film. Yeah. That cannot be made for mm -hmm. anything less than whatever it's required to do. You know, and I know that others have tried, but you know, if, if we don't tell that, that Mark Rothko type story that that, that, that story about our own artists, yeah. then we will have failed as storytellers yeah. as well. Herb, do you want to respond? You want to respond to the accusations, Herb? Feels <laughs> 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 like the Senate's well, 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 like talking to my lawyer. <laughs> 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 okay, for Herbert, one more question. For me. No, for Ezekiel Guerra and, oh, yeah. and uh, Pablo Bracho were in that project. Yeah. It was wonderful, and I just wanted to find out if you're still doing work uh, well in Texas and just in other regional theaters. Yes, so yes. I yes, I am. I, 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 after that, I wrote a play called The Weekend with Pablo Picasso. Yeah. Yeah.
pay back. But you know what he involved? He's lying. He's going to work hard over there. Does he have a familia? He's got a mother and a brother right here in the Longoche. What about a father? A father? No, Don Diablo, poor man. He died in the revolution with Diaz. <laughs> Pancho Villa! He's dead, Don Diablo. And no longer see he's dead.
We are now going to jump back and take a look at the Teatro Campesino's history. It was wonderful to see uh, culture clash up here and bring up the notion of familia and also the notion of the fact that they are three co-artists and co-conspirators. But the spirit of El Teatro Campesino is such that we have a tremendous amount of artists, perhaps over 200, maybe even 300 over the span of 50 years, that have claimed that name and call San Juan a home. And so this panel here reflects a portion of that history. There are members of the Teatro Campesino, current generations, uh, out here in the audience, I just want to acknowledge your presence as well. So what we're going to do is start first with this particular glorious uh, presentation. Even though I am part of the familia for a second, try to imagine me as an objective person. <laughs> <laughs> so if I were not her son, if I was not her son, and I asked the question, what was the best times for El Teatro Campesino? How would each of you frame them? And let's go ahead and start. Well, uh, you know, I I, I would uh, I was with the company for almost a dozen years, um, and I met my husband there. Um, so I guess that was a high point. <laughs> and um, you know, we, we toured uh, Europe for many years. We would go every other year, and uh, I would pack uh, clothes for the winter, and then I'd send them back, and then buy clothes in Italy uh, because we were there for almost six months every other year for, uh, from the late 70s into the early 80s. And we were on a circuit with uh, these international groups, and we were at that level. The aesthetic was so high, and it was in part because the life we led back in San Juan Bautista, in which uh, there was not a moment that we were not living the Apple. Uh, we were studying. We were in the morning doing uh, morning exercises. Luis would come in. He had these notebooks that are incredible in which he would, you know, imagine uh, different ways of moving, different ways of listening to your heart. Uh, we, we were really like athletes, always in training. And so uh, living together so closely, um, breathing, eating the same food, um, and thinking the same, we were, were able to come up with shows in which they were devised. We didn't know if that's what they were. Uh, we would improvise work. Uh, Luis would script it. Uh, we did one show, Fina and Mundo, one of the first versions, because we would do, you know, over five years, many, many shows of the same name. And it would be, start off very uh, surrealistic and end up as a realistic play. And that, that happened with Fina and Mundo to Mundo. And, um, I, w one year we went out on the road with absolutely no end, and you're like, oh my god, we ran out of time. So we would have to improvise our end. It was frightening. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, 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 and, and, and it was really one of our least successful shows, I think, but it was the first version of many to come, which eventually uh, became very successful. And, and so we would go on these tours, and we were influenced, and we'd see other international groups. At that time, uh, Mongo Mines was on the road a lot with us. We were on, you know, we played the same, same festivals. Um, and, and we were, uh, you know, quite, quite the toast of Europe. And uh, I think those years I'm very proud of. Uh, uh, and uh, I think the work that we did was universal and very classic. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that I've been at Center Theater Group in January 20 years. Mm. It's amazing. Who knew the time would fly so quickly? And yet, the almost 12 years that I spent in San Juan Bautista with the Teatro completely shaped me. That, that bell will never be, uh, I mean, the values that I learned, the, the, yeah. what I learned as an artist, the notion of being an activist, the notion of making choices and acting on those choices has 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 framed has, has shaped me, and uh, and it, it was because of the intense uh, living uh, that we that we that we had together. So I think that that for me is totally a highlight. And so in terms of the 50-year epic trajectory that is a death of Casino, where did that fall? Do you think that happened uh, mid 70s to mid 80s? So the death was approximately 10 to 15. 
and I, I think uh, when, once Peter Brook came uh, to, to San Juan Bautista, you know, I think that was a whole other, it started another kind of research, I think. Uh, he came with his company and stayed with us this summer, and I think that that was a, a transitional period for us, I, I think. <coughs> For you, same question. What is the what was the best? What is the best? Or what was or is? Well, you know, it's like asking who uh, who's your favorite uh, child. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
And it's, it, it's like going as far away as you can think of, it, it, away from where we can go. I had a professor who had transferred from San Jose State to, to Brandeis University. And he said, come, and we'll restage your first play in front of Hannah Pantovia at Brandeis to get an MFA. And there's an off-Broadway producer that's interested in producing in New York. This is 1964. So I saw this, the road opened up in two different directions, you know. <coughs> One led to New York in 1964, off-Broadway, and an MFA at Brandeis. The other one led to Delano and sleeping on the floor <laughs> and having my ass dead with everybody else. I went to Delano. I went to Delano <laughs> because that was the route. It was the right route that I, I needed to relate to. And I have, I've had many moments like that in, in over the 50 years of my involvement. Many happy moments, incredibly joyful, happy moments. Uh, really, not the fancy moments, I mean the joyful moments of just working, some of the moments that Diane was talking about, freezing our asses off in the old warehouse, and yet doing creative work, you know, and really putting flax together so we could get a kerosene heater just to be able to get warm, because we had no heat in this big old warehouse. And, and uh, we're still there, we have a new warehouse, but that has no heat. <laughs> I don't know, but we, but we got to do that. I want to keep that edge somehow, <laughs> reminding us, you know, that, that it, it, you have to stay on the edge to do your work, you know. And, and it's not about the thing. It's not about the position. It's about the joy that you get when you're doing it. And if you can always go back to that point, it's a bit chaotic now, but you always go back to that point, you'll never lose it, you know? I mean, you, you will continue to regenerate whatever it is that got you into it in the first place. The word is commitment. You have to commit to the act of doing theater, theater or film, or politics, and put your ass on the line, because that'll keep you alive, you know? The other night, last week, uh, we had just wrapped up my, a, a run uh, of Valley of the Heart, my last latest play of 10 weeks, you know, with, of, of maybe we'll discuss it later, but the thing is that we had transferred it from our little 150 seat packing house theater in San Juan that you have to pack theater to the World Theater in Monterey Bay, 450 seats, a uh, new set, uh, all done within a, two weeks, just building a new set, re rehearsing the people getting in there, and then two packed houses, tremendous response. And, and the, the professional achievement, the look of it, was something that I was very proud of because I've always wanted that for the theater. And then the next week we came back to San Juan last week and we were rehearsing the Los Huertos, our actors for the street, in our rehearsal room, a tiny little room that Pinan developed. And then Esperanza del Valle, a dance group, is on stage. And then we had a group, Hijos del Sol from Salinas, building calaveras, you know, and then preparing our, our stage. And it was a moment of chaos, but it was a beautiful moment. I felt so happy, Lupe recognized that too. I felt so happy, <laughs> Lupe said she was blessed, that to be part of that moment, and, and the teatro has had many of those moments. You gotta age with it though, okay? I'm not no longer the, the 25 year old full of piss and vinegar, okay? I'm the almost 75 year old, yeah, maestro viejo, you know what I'm saying? But I find joy uh, from the same activity. Yeah, the Calavera, the Calavera has always been one of the standard figures. Right. If you play the Calavera, 
that you saw in, in the film. But you know, in that first play that we took to France, it was like Calavera de Lucio Vasquez, it was an actor with, with these crude Calavera masks. I connect with Mastanoes from Mexico, they were doing Calaveras also. But that, that idea then, that a lot of the theater piece comes a, a national holiday that we're all sharing. What, what a fantastic, mind blowing uh, reflection. Yes. So I have a question, a follow up that's con uh, from this conversation we've heard that the politics has been important. Mm -hmm. And then, second to that, how lovely this little town of San Juan <laughs> that is that mm -hmm. has been together from home. And so, for the benefit of everybody here, <coughs> Why a little tiny town of 1,800 people? Why did the Teatro move there? And what is it, what is it mean, meant being there for over 40 years now? 43 years, yeah. OK, if, if you've seen the film Vertigo, you know, the, if the mission where Kim Novak takes a dive, and that's our mission. That's how much. That's a plaza there where Jimmy Stewart walks. But that's how uh, much. But then, for whatever it's still 1,800 people. <laughs> and, and we can't even drink the water out of the faucet. It's pretty uh, nice. But the, the fact is that San Juan Bautista uh, used to be uh, larger than El Cuero de los Antes. Or in point of accuracy, El Cuero de los Antes used to be smaller than San Juan Bautista. San Juan Bautista is in the Central Coast area, Monterey Bay area, inland. Uh, so it was taken over by the Americans, not to say gringos, very quickly. And, and they came and closed order, you know, right away. And, and so because it was a seat of revolutions, it was the military capital of California. Jose Castro was the last military governor of California, uh, along with Pio Pico and some of the others. You know, but the thing is that he left. He, he sold all of his properties and went back. He became the governor of Baja California until he was assassinated in the 1850s. Uh, his house is still there in San Juan. I wanted to be able to recapture our history. I was tired of being like an alien in the place where I was born. Mm. And everywhere I went, there were barrios that seemed to be put away, marginalized, okay. even here. You know, the people live in West L.A. that had never been to East L.A. Mm -hmm. I, one of my editors, Al Baba, had never been to East L.A., and he was born here, okay? Mm. Spent all his life in West L.A. Uh, but the thing is that, that the idea of barrio is something that is visited in all our towns. And San Juan it has no barrio. San Juan is all barrio or no barrio. <laughs> And, and it's, it's got everybody there, but it's, it's, it's working through its problems, you know, very slowly. But it's like, a, it's like a kernel of history that's left there. And we have been confronting the Western myth there for 43 years. We went to the mission because that was accessible. And there, in Italian, the Virgen de Guadalupe, which we've been doing for 43 years, we're doing it again, to revive, okay, the, uh, one of the roots of Latino theater, which is in the church. And we also do the pastorela. But we did it in the streets to begin with. But the idea then is to, is to crack the nut of this little town. Crack the nut of this little town so it opens up to us, to the new Americans. We're not excluding anybody else. As a matter of fact, we're, we're embracing all of Asians, we're embracing African Americans, we're embracing Anglo Americans. It doesn't matter what your background is. We just want someone to reflect us. We want someone to be green. You know, this election, yesterday, we defeated okay. fracking. <laughs> Sending all, spending all kinds of money to come in and frack the fuck out of San Diego County, you know, because it's only 50,000 people. But we beat them. Wow. We beat them, you know. And the press conference that helped to do that was held in a Teatro Campesino. Wow. It was held in a Teatro Campesino with the only benefit. It's tiny, but I call it the eye of the hurricane, the hurricane being California. Wow. And so we have had culture class there. Diane knows we've had roots. Over the years, you know, Poncho Sanchez, you know, the, 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 the Cal Jader, Lidia Mendoza, Lalo Guerrero. We've had fantastic artists in our little tiny of Chetreo. It doesn't matter how humble your house is. It doesn't matter. It's how you receive people, okay? So if you're in some little bottle or if you're someplace in a, in a little storefront, fine, beautiful. You know, I, we have a running joke. Every time I see a storefront, I say, the death of Christina was big here. You know? <laughs> and Martin, I say, man, this would be a great home for us. You know, but because I, I love the fact that San Juan is, is out of the way, that it seems like a backwater, because that's where the power is, man. That's where the power mm -hmm. is. You know, when we, when we uh, went uh, tour, and we were so exhausted, it was a great place to come back to. Yeah. Yeah. 
and there is a kind of calmness and peacefulness about, about the, the area that allows you to create. And so when you're thinking about work and devising work in a big city, I, 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 uh, uh, Basalva's here, she's in the Bronx, wow! You know, they're creating work in, a, in, a, in an area that is just bustling, and we, we did the opposite. You know, we, we created in a, in a, in a city, that, in a town, that gave us peace, and, um, and, that, and that worked for us. We still have that yeah. flamenco group that's based in New York, yeah. and comes once a year, and the director of Martin was one of our plays, and the first time he came back a couple years ago, he stopped at the teatro and he kissed the steps. <laughs> it was coming from New York City, you know? And the thing is that they came to rehearse the piece in San Juan, and then to take it back. And they brought Lee Brewer, you know, again, you may know his name, to, to direct them. And so we're running rehearsals in one room, and Lee Brewer is working with the flamencos in the other room. I mean, really, you can make it happen. You've got the commitment, okay? You've got the soul for it. You can cut through all the other money problems and the personnel problems and whatever the training problems. You just gotta keep pushing because you're committed to the idea. Did you have any reflections on San Juan Bautista, what it's done for the theater, or what it's done to be part of the best of times? Well, you know, my mother used to always say, uh, because we used to do all our shows free, and especially in San Juan. And she, of course, in Spanish, but she didn't speak English, said, when are you going to start charging? <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things I think that she always said, I'm going to go back to my mother, uh, is that you have to find yourself with it. You have to own your own place. We, we bought that building uh, back in 1978. Very nice. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we, uh, it, it, we bought it, we always say that it was a house that Jutsu built because it was crazy. We had a balloon payment in two years, and uh, at that time it was $175,000, which is nothing now. But at that time, when we were making, you know, uh, you know $100 a, a month, you know, that was a lot of money. So it, we ended up buying the building in two years because of the royalties and Jutsu. And wow. that's why we own that building. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has rooted us. Actually, Lupe handled all the transactions. I want to make that. <laughs> you know, we learn from, you know, uh, we have our mentors, we have our, our family, we have our parents, and some teachers. I mean, my mother taught me how to economize, you know. So we keep our life pretty simple in San Juan, um, but we, we own our building. It's, it's leaky right now, but you know, it's still our own. And, uh, but I think that has rooted us in San Juan. So I think I can remember the time we performed at the Inner City Cultural Center. Uh, here in Vermont, you know, yeah. and it was raining then too, and and, uh, and it rained, and we had to get out in costume, right, with the mops, because the seats were wet for the audience, and so in character, like a familia raspache, the teatro went out and mopped the floor, <laughs> and, and the seats, you know, and and uh, oh, it was just it was just fantastic, you know. So you already identified a couple of challenges, right? In some cases, uh, the infrastructure. The what are some of the challenges that you face in the 50-year trajectory of a death of empathy? What have you faced? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, mean I, I, you know, here, this is a group that, that, that you know, there were, there, it's twofold. This was an ensemble. I was part of an ensemble. And then Luis also had his career. So there was a double, a double whammy here. You had the moments in which we had to create a show, and uh, Luis was, uh, you know, rehearsing suit suit, and we were in Europe, and the and 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 so you began to see that we, we were a tight ensemble, and then Luis had aspirations, and and rightfully so, and so he he began to. Uh, you know, uh, write much more. He started to doing films, and it, there was a change. There was an evolution in the company, and we had to adjust to that. And it wasn't it wasn't easy. Uh, I, I remember uh, uh, Europe uh, in, in, the, in the late 70s. Uh, we were doing a show at a um, immigrant housing, and it was a tough show. And I was sitting in the back of the police, 
and we were having a hard time in the tech. And he turns to me, and he probably doesn't even remember, and says, man, I, I got I to gotta do other things. You know? I remember, yeah, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, I'm tired of us watching. Yeah, I'm tired, I'm tired of us watching. And, and uh, we had had a, a very bad uh, incident right when we were rehearsing. And our lead actor was in a terrible accident. Uh, and he was ne actually never the same after that. His best was not that he's never the same after that, really. I could perform here in L.A. at the Biltmore. And then, and, then, around, and then turned around and headed back to someone the same night and, and in the intersection yeah. between Highway 5 and 152, <coughs> uh, we were broadsided by, by someone out drunk. And, 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 Never be on the road after 2, 2 a.m. or if you are, be very careful. There's a lot of brunch. Right. Uh, I mean, it, 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 people were, I mean, the was thrown in the car, broke, literally broke its face. I mean, it was a terrible, terrible accident. And we were rehearsing for Europe. And uh, Luis had to, to step in. And believe me, Luis was, he had young kids, but, you know, he was young. I mean, it, it was a crazy, he, he was not prepared, you know. To, but he had to do the role, the lead role. And, uh, and, and, and it was a hard, it was hard for you. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was, you had to readjust because you hadn't planned on going with us. And we're rehearsing a moment uh, where we come out, and uh, I'm, I'm playing the skeleton, and uh, I'm holding a huge cross. And we're like, and I come out with this cross, and I'm supposed to hit the pelado, which he was playing, and he's supposed to duck, supposed to duck. And <laughs> Theater happen. Mm -hmm. We needed an audience. Mm -hmm. 
So part of what we were doing was developing an audience, mm -hmm. just an audience. Obviously, we needed actors. So part of what we were doing developing actors, raw, man, crudos, you know, up the guy, no training whatsoever. But they jumped in and did the thing. I tried it with Campesinos, of course, and then went on to include other people, students in Chicago. We had no directors. They even knew what directing was. We had no playwrights. None. My only antecedent before I began to write, before I wrote this wrong, I had a bunch of theft, actually, on the play, was Josefina Nigli, who wrote back in the 1920s and the 1930s. And then my other antecedent that I acknowledge was Rodolfo Sigli and Mexico. Mm. Okay, so I had, I had, and I, but then I began to realize that I had other antecedents in the American theater, in the labor theater, in the theater of the 1930s, Harold Fluorman, the group theater. You know, that, that, and then William Soroyan came to the Shrugana Bunch of uh, and John Howard Lawson, the founder of the, uh, of the Writers Guild here in Hollywood, a playwright also, Broadway playwright, who was one of the blacklisted Hollywood ten. You always see him in the old newsreels. But the thing is that these people, these two guys, uh, these two men, saw my first play, Shrugana Bunch of and they said, this is it, you're on, you're on a track, you know? So I felt accepted on that level, but there were no other Latinos. So we had to create a reality. But this overview has been with me for 50 years, we continue to develop. And this is why I was overjoyed that this encuentro was happening here with such a high level of participation and such a high level of commitment. Yeah, 
Rabbisino, you know, to be able to welcome people when they come there. I hope that still survive. Mm -hmm. That you are all my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, we all call uh, cultural revolutionaries working on the same thing, because otherwise you wouldn't be here. And, uh, you know, I think that that's the legacy and that I hope that that will continue with whatever happens to the government. I think, you know, the past has been laid out for quite a while. I want to acknowledge my longtime colleague and compañero Jorge Huerta. Jorge and I have been partners in this enterprise now for quite a number of years, almost the whole 50 years, you know. But the, the, uh, I was very glad to see that online you mentioned the Encuentro, you know, in 74. The, uh, Fifth Latino uh, Chicano Theater Festival in Mexico City, uh, and Primer Encuentro Latino Americano. It was 40 years ago this year. And mm -hmm. 300 guestistas from the United States uh, went to Mexico City, <laughs> plus the San Francisco Mike. <laughs> and, and we encountered our colegas from <laughs> South America. <laughs> and, and it was an explosion. This we understood because that was the year after Pinochet had devastated Chile and then killed uh, Allende, you know, in government and dictatorship, which was uh, having an iron grip in Latin America. And that's what Latino groups wanted to respond to in their own way. They couldn't do it openly, they did it theatrically. We were coming from the United States, La Panza del Monstruo, <laughs> con panzas chicanas, you know. Uh, Talking about identity problems. <laughs> 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 Who are we? Are we black? <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they said, Who are you? <laughs> you know, what's your problem? And then uh, after most of the Latin, Latino, Latino, but we speak Spanish, right? So when we had our treaty pass, uh, all the Latinos could do was bite their tongues. And, and so they saw the actors, the Latinos saw the actors, and they said, but this isn't theater, you know, this is, there's no training, this is crude, what is this? So it was explosive, and there was a lot of misunderstanding. It personally took me 30 years, literally, to get back to Mexico City. And when I did, I went back to teach a workshop to the same people in Cleta that had cracked all over us, you know, <laughs> in, in Mexico City. Uh, but yeah, we got there again, thanks to the Mascarones, who were aging by this time, and they were able to set up this, this encuentro, this new, among ourselves. I went and gave workshops, and we talked, you know, and everybody apologized to everybody. And <laughs> but then I was also invited, uh, not too long after, to, to meet with the SOPEM, the Sociedad General de Escritores Mexicanos, that had a session for me. And then we had a, an encuentro in, in Puebla, you know, sponsored by SOPEM to discuss the work, my work in the Teatro Campesino. And then not long afterward then, I was invited to direct uh, the revival and world premiere in Spanish of Zutsu with the Compañía Nacional de Teatro de Mexico. Mm -hmm. And this was in 2010. It was a tremendous hit. They said, don't expect to react to that in LA. If we got the reaction, we got it in LA. Mm -hmm. It helped with the Arizona was going to shit. They were good, they were responding. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is that, that we won the Critics Award, Best Mexican Music, Year, you know, mm -hmm. it, it had that qualitative title for some reason, the Mexican music. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the Compañía has continued to do the play. It revived it twice in Mexico City. They took it to Bogota, Colombia, and on December 5th and 6th, they're coming to the SECU, the Centro Cultural de Tijuana. Okay, right here. We're going to be in the box. So for me, as a Chicano playwright, to be able to go back to Mexico and deal with my professional contemporaries, to meet Hugo and Pascón Banda, you know. Uh, and, and who, like Peter Palmaí, was one of the great ones, you know, of, of playwrights. And we considered a Mexican, at the same time that I'm an American, and a Chicano. And, and we affirm my Latino consciousness, pero en español, hacer en español también, porque ya también tenemos tertulias y críticas, ya hay que hablar en el idioma de nuestros antepasados, y también de poder escribir ese idioma, si no directamente entre con traductores, porque nuestro trabajo, nuestras obras tienen que ser conocidas en América Latina, Y el futuro tiene que ver, el futuro para mí es un futuro bilingüe. Estamos hablando de... Ahora, 
México, la ciudad de México es como la capital central para todo latinoamericano. Toda América Latina está aquí. Y para mí fue como Nueva York. Yo puse, pude estar finalmente en mi New York, en mi Nueva York, que viene siendo la ciudad de México. Y tuve éxito en México y me siento más chicano que nunca. <risa> Think about the border. Don't let the border separate you. All of Latin America. Let's do it in Spanish, do it in English, do it in French, do it in Chino, it doesn't matter. Do it in whatever language, but reach out. Thank you for the question and answer period. And first, I'd just like to do just a quick poll. So first, I'd like to acknowledge the current members of the Afro Campesino who are sitting down here. So you stand up. Our stage, and that became our signature stage at the beginning. 
And it was wonderful because, again, when you're forced to perform on a tiny little stage, you have to really move your body. So my training for the San Francisco Mind Group, the mind, came in really handy. The use of masks, the use of signs, all of that was because the space was so small. And actually, last weekend, we took a trailer out to the streets of San Juan. We had the calaveras out there performing on the tiny little space, and it was refreshing again to do that. You know, it's like it's like rejuvenating your roots again, saying this feels good, you know. From an active standpoint, it's a tremendous challenge, but it's wonderful because you're out there in nature, you're out there in the open, at least we were, out in the middle of nowhere, and yet we were it, we were there. You know, we made there happen there, right there, where we were. And you can do that with the theater. That's the wonder of our art form. You can make life happen instantaneously on a street corner or in a barrio. You can turn a storefront into a majestic playhouse. Yes, that's the wonder of it. That's the beauty of it. You know, it's empowering the poor. They don't have to have any money. These companies didn't have any money. They couldn't even read or write, some of them. But man, they could act. You know, they could get out there and do stuff. And the, and the audience is popping them for it. And, and just seeing that love exchange was tremendous. Okay? Uh, and there's Good that question. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, one of my. And in like 72, 71, 72, I, put, I did my first workshop with you at the Ford Theater from the, from the Marte Performer when we were doing the improv. That's right, you and Mark Wilder, yeah. Yeah. Now, the exercise that you did from, it was the Aztec, some, I don't know, it was right after my mushroom day, so it was. <laughs> I remember number four with the chair. But do you have these exercises uh, in in uh, Teatro Campesino workshop book that people can get? Yes, we do. I have uh, it's called the called Viper Being Workshop. The Viper Being Workbook. Okay. Viper Being is a dance to again an aesthetic that we've developed over the last fifty years. It's rooted in Mayan thought. We need to read, uh, means vibrant being in Maya, that we are all vibrant beings. You know, we're not, we're not me, we're not, we're, 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 we're vibration. And so working out of that, uh, we, we've broken into four columns, which is the Vinca Basis, which is the sacred calendar, breaks into four columns of five steps each. So the first five steps relate to the body, the next step is the heart, you know, the uh, the third column is the mind, Chuan uh, Ben Ish Ben. And then uh, the fourth column is the spirit, or what we call the vibration. Ben Ish Ben Kaban, it's not the Waka you know. And so, all together, the Vinkit Basel, to me, she Kakwal, and she Chanki Mima Nikola, not the book, when Ben Ish Ben Kikaban, it's not the Waka Hau, right? Those are the Vinkit Basels. So we do a workshop with Vinkit Basels. Now, there's only a few people that can teach this. Kinan can teach this. Uh, uh, members of the theater, a few members can teach it. Uh, so the workbook is, is for uh, further elucidation. Yes, I read. It's not published yet. It's the greatest exercises that, that I've ever done in my life. Wow! And that was three. <laughs> no wonder you're so young. <laughs> no wonder you're so young. You look great. Well, what was that? That you said? <laughs> You mentioned that, uh, you know, audience development, and over the 50 years you've probably seen a lot of audience members. Now that we're reaching this new America, what should we keep in mind, like as young producers, as we move forward towards audience development? Well, once again, uh, if I did to play Valley of the Heart, deals with uh, uh, two families, one Mexican-American, the other Japanese-American family. It's a love story. But it deals with the Japanese concentration camps from a Chicano point of view. The storyteller is a Chicano who falls in love with a Japanese American farmer's daughter. And then he sees, they have a son, and he sees that family go into the concentration camps. Now, the unexpected audience development factor for us was the Asian American community. They came screaming to San Juan Bautista. They have donated funds. And, and really what they are, the reason they do that is because they appreciate the story that we're telling in the play. And these are realistic characters. And yet they're archetypical. And, and the fact is we're telling a story that exists in their mentality and in their pain, 
And as one minority group to another, I've looked across, we've looked across and said, okay, we're going to tell your story for a change and see ourselves in the mirror. When I was writing the play, I felt that I was seeing myself in a Japanese American mirror. And that was refreshing to me. And then also I had to take, it took me 10 years to decide to do this without help because um, I wasn't sure that I could go into the Japanese American experience. But I did research and I based it on all of my experiences. And, uh, and it seems to have garnered enough respect so that we have a lot of support in the Japanese and Asian American community. Now, audience development is about who you, who you, who's on stage is reflected in the audience. And, and I remember walking into the table when I, when I went in there to do Zutu the first time. And I saw, I forget what play it was, a very famous <coughs> play that they had on the stage. And then I looked at the audience and I said, man, these people are angry. You know what I mean? The, the place is full of angles. <laughs> and, and then later when we did Zoot Suit, I remember looking out at the audience and realizing half are Anglos. This is my audience. I never claimed them, but because of the taper they came, and they're my audience. So it is my duty as a playwright to respect them as human beings. <coughs> now very often there's a lot of anger. Culture class mentioned, Richard mentioned also, you know, working when you're young, you're full of anger. And I was full of anger. And, and the actors are very direct, and because they need to be. But over the years, I have deepened in my understanding that there are no villains, ultimately, really. There are no villains. We just need to understand what the relation, and then dramatize it in a way that people can understand it. So audience development is about who are you touching? And I think that the new American audience has to reflect America, has to reflect who's here, who's in the country. And I don't think the regional theater is doing it yet. They're doing it yet. I'll never sit down. She's done a wonderful job of defending this point at, at the table. But it, it's not just the table, it's all of the regional theaters. And not, they don't need to create a category for us. They don't need to open up one slot and say, okay, it's going to be a Latino play, right? You know? Yeah. Or an African American play. Because that just, that's smorgasbord, you know? What we need is just to be acknowledged as human beings. You know, why, why aren't we in more plays? Why, why every time that they ask one of our politicians uh, an interview in one of the talk shows, it's always about immigration? Yeah. What, we have no thoughts about Iraq? Yeah. We have no thoughts Thank about the crowd? We have no thoughts about anything else and women's rights? We can talk to all those issues, and that's the lesson for the theater. So audience development, if you're broad enough in your pieces, you will attract more people, okay? Can I just jump in on that really quickly? Is there been a motto that the theater has carried forth as a rallying cry that has inspired our, all generations of the theater? That's if theater doesn't, if people don't go to the theater, then theater must go to the people. Mm -hmm. And that can be in terms of the content, but also the places, and that is something that, that he's been I'm going to go upstairs. Yes. Personal question. I think it's so, because I'm getting married in six months, and I'm lucky enough to be working with my fiance at our own small theater company. And uh, just some advice on how I can make sure that she doesn't kill me. <laughs> 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 you know, I think you have to be kind to each other. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there are highs and lows in any marriage, as people that have been married a long time will uh, testify to that. But I think the bottom line is respect. If you have respect for each other, you can survive anything. And, um, you know, we, we talk about being mirror reflections. We are to each other. And uh, I think that one of the things that has sustained our marriage for 45 years is that respect for one another. And uh, right from the beginning, you know, if we have words that are not, you know, for public, we don't say them. You know, we, we respect each other in that, in that sense. But, you know, I, I still have my voice. I can still say what I mean. Well, I don't have to say the meaning. <laughs> <laughs>
As somebody who's had a front line seat to that, <laughs> I would say keep creating together. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've, the moments that I've seen them joyful and, and sense the bliss that they share with everybody is when they remain collaborators. Recently, my mother, uh, the costume design, has been a collaborator of my father's new work, Valley of the Park. And that is a beautiful thing to witness, that type of collaboration, both creating a family and a company and as artists together. Good question. Also, I mean, I think you need to know that an artist, especially an artist, who goes into the zone and, and may not pay attention to some of the essentials, yeah. uh, needs a partner that will watch his or her back at those given moments in the creative process. And Lupe has been my life support for 45 years that we've been married, for 46 years since she came into the company. And, and, and the thing is that I, I couldn't exist, I couldn't do what I do without her help. I never could have done it. Zuzu could not have happened. She was pregnant with our youngest son, Lakin, whom you may have seen back around, you know. He was born, uh, well, he was actually, I was late, I was trying to turn this later. I was two weeks overdue, and she was two weeks overdue. <laughs> and she kept saying, "You gotta have the, you gotta finish the play because I gotta have the baby." You know. So the day that I had a long stretch, seventy-two hours with no scenes, and I hopped on a plane, bring it to the paper. Uh, she called, and as I was sitting down in the production meeting, and she said, "My water broke." And then the phone went dead, and, and I had no choice but to turn right around, go back to LAX, and fly back to to. Hassan was there, and then made my way to Salinas. Please don't offend him, pick me up. Uh, uh, you know, this country of past please. And he took me to the hospital, and my wife had just had Lakin, you know. And, and Lakin was born into this fervor, you know. And, and it's great if you can do it as a family, man, you know. It's great. And Francis Ford Coppola, you know, who's our friend, also comes to San Juan from time to time. They said, you know, a lot of people hold back because they're artists because they say, well, I don't know if I can afford to get married, I'm an artist. He says, don't wait. He says, do it. If you have a partner, somebody that you love, you can support each other. And that support will help you to do your work.
You know, I had an experience in New York uh, in the Chrysler Building some years ago. I went and did a, I think of James Suzuki, but I did an interview live uh, in New York City. And I was really impressed because the, the two hosts were um, uh, kind of reflective of two ends of, of the Latino world. And, and the hostess was very blonde and blue-eyed, kind of Espanola, but she was Latina. And the, the other host was very African-American looking, but uh, Puerto Rican or Dominicano, I forget which, but also very, very Latino. And then there was me, you know, uh, Indian Joe, you know, in between. And, 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 we, and we were speaking to New York, the greater New York area, and people were calling in Espanol, hablando, Latinos from all over Latin America, and I, I just took that memory and put it away like a treasure, because it seemed to me that day, that morning, I was talking to all of Latin America, you know, in New York City. The thing that I expect from you is to develop the image of America. We are not recent arrivals. Mm -hmm. We are America. And it bothers me when they talk about people coming from Mexico to America, or from Puerto Rico, or Cuba, or Latin America to America. America, the United States is not America. Mm -hmm. It is the United States of America. Mm -hmm. But we need to share that. Now, the challenge before you is evident. If you saw the electoral map last night, <laughs> it's all those red states in the middle. Okay? <laughs> New York is relatively blue. California is blue. You have Oregon. You have areas that are blue. And blue kind of means more consciousness, you know. But it's those red areas. Yet they have a lot of promise. We need, and yet those are the people who go to New York and see plays on Broadway. You know? <laughs> I don't know if they get to the Bronx. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. 